Have you been considering strip tillage on your farm? This six part video series is gonna look at the equipment, the economics, and how to make strip tillage work for you. In this video, we're gonna talk about integrating fertilizer into a strip till system. Some of the advantages and challenges of making it work with strip till. Ken, what did you need to do to prove to yourself that strip till would work on your farm? We were very sold on the concept. Uh, yeah, so proof is essentially the, the, the time in 2004 when we, we actually demoed a machine and put in replicate blocks uh, between the tillage system we were currently doing, which was basically a fall tandem disc uh, followed by a spring light cultivation. And uh, uh, the results of those replicated, replicated experiments Granted, only one year, but that gave us enough confidence to say, yeah, this, this, this is going to work. And from there on, it's essentially, it's, it's more of a mental game where you say to yourself, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to figure out how to, how to make it work. Can you talk a bit about how important it is for the planter units to stay on the strip that you've made? Uh, Tony Vine's done quite a bit of work at Purdue on, uh, on that. And essentially, uh, for every couple of inches you get off the center of the strip, uh, uh, you know, yield goes down fairly dramatically, especially by the time you get four inches off, 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 off of optimum. We've literally seen that where you see where the, where the row can stray off to the, to the, off the center of the strip and vigor and uh, emergence percentages really, uh, really go down. So uh, staying on the strip is, is critical. Tell us about your tractor guidance configuration. So, uh, our tractor guidance, uh, so we're on full RTK guidance and uh, it, uh, we had had nothing before then. So in 2007 when we started this, actually we went from, from not having as much as even a light bar on the place to a full uh, RTK auto steer system. Uh, in, in, and it was in the, the Caterpillar tractor that we currently still run. So part of the reason we actually uh, uh, went with the two-track cat was uh, uh, they're actually seemingly very easy to keep, uh, to configure and to calibrate and to keep, keep in a, in a, in the, on the row or on the, on the guidance line. So uh, RTK and, and uh, that's, that's what we started with. Have you added guidance to the strip tiller and or planter and what has this meant uh, to your success with the system? Yeah, so we, we started out with guidance uh, auto steer on our strip till rig. Uh, our uh, and thankfully again in 2004 when we, when we did a little bit of work with Greg Stewart, uh, the, the system or the setup we had at that time actually had a row marker and uh, that was one of the things that made us realize that row markers in wheat stubble uh, just aren't good enough and so uh, we went to guidance straight to guidance when we bought our strip till rig uh, we did not originally have guidance on our planter tractor uh, ran it for probably eight or nine years uh, without it but have subsequently put it on and uh, really quite enjoy it because it gives you a lot more time uh, to be turned around in the seat watching what the planter units are doing, making sure you're centered on the row and, uh, and all those good things. So not essential on a planter, but uh, really, really nice. Um, as far as implement guidance uh, on, our, on our stirrup till rig, uh, ours is a mounted rig or a semi-mount uh, rig on the planter or on the tractor. So therefore, if the tractor's on the line, the, the strip till rig is on the line. If it was a, uh, if it was a pull type, uh, uh, system, then we, we probably would look at implement guidance, uh, seriously consider it, but it's certainly not essential uh, in our system because it's a semi-mount. Um, as far as implement guidance on the planter, uh, our experience uh, is that, and especially now that we're, uh, we're into a coulter system, uh, our, uh, our planter just seems to follow the strip, once they're in the strip, seems to follow the strip a whole lot better than it used to. Uh, probably if I was still back on a shank system with that high, kind of higher, taller berm, that's more of a challenge to stay centered on, uh, I would, I might consider uh, implement guidance on the planter a lot more so uh, than I already do. 
from a planability perspective, how important do you feel it is to match up your strip tiller width with your planter width? In field, if you're on an RTK system, we run a two aerial system where we have uh, both an aerial on the strip till unit and the one on the tractor, which is guiding the system. And we run the same system on our planter, aerial on the beacon on the planter and tractor. Up and down the field is, doesn't really matter. It's headlands or could be an issue. You know, that's a, there's a learning curve on headlands and how to, especially you know, if it's straight line, simple. No issues. No issues, but trying to get a planner to follow a curve, there's challenges. Yeah. Mike, just curious if you could comment on, you know, spring versus fall strip till where you guys have started out, where you've kind of moved to now at this point. Yeah, so we are primary fall strips. Um, we've been lucky, most falls we get all of our fall strips in. Um, we have done many plots, fall strips versus spring strips. Um, on the right soil, it doesn't make a difference. On the heavier soil, we do feel the fall strips are the way to go. And just from a strip condition perspective? Uh, yeah, at least with the heavier soil, it has time to get that frost action. Um, if it's like a sandy loam, I, I don't think it makes a whole lot different. So again, Mike, a common question I hear from guys getting started with strip till, especially coming out of conventional till, is you know, if we're making those fall strips, do we need to hit those again in the springtime to really make a good seed bed? Yeah, so we've done like three years of plots with that. Um, we thought it would help. Um, from our economic and yield prospect, the simple answer is no. Uh, stale seabed is the most economical way to go. Um, it doesn't yield any different than the refresher, so it's times you put your costs of hitting it again in the spring. Um, you're not gaining any days of planting. So yeah, simple answer is uh, refreshing uh, from what we've seen had no benefits. So you mentioned you don't like the second pass in the spring. You don't feel it delivers a lot to you. Did you do any, uh, any yield tests to verify that or you can just tell from, from what your experience? Uh, our experience is uh, just don't waste your time on that second pass. Didn't bring anything to the table at all. So again, common question from guys, if you're going to fertilizer in the strip, um, do you still need, do you feel you still need to start a fertilizer on the planter when you're coming back to plant that strip afterwards? Uh, we don't have started fertilizer on our planter, but we do run 60 pounds of nitrogen on a two by two by two system. Um, but we don't run any P and K or starters on the planter. So with the switch to the strip tillage, what is your P and, P P and K program for, uh, for the system? Okay, so it starts in the fall. Uh, we'll run the machine deeper in the fall and uh, with the row cleaners as aggressive as we can get to try and keep the strip as black as we can. Um, so we're running about five inches deep in the fall and we're, uh, that's where we moved most of our potash application to. Um, trying to, and so these disc units will blend the fertility fairly uniformly in that five inch deep, 10 inch wide berm. And uh, in the last few years, as our uh, soil tests have indicated, we've moved a small portion of our map to the fall as well to try and get the build component of our fertility program on in the fall. In the spring, um, if we choose to freshen the strips, we'll run through with primarily just straight urea, um, aiming to get about 70 pounds on ahead of time, uh, ahead of planting. And then uh, the remainder of the fertility, uh, primarily phosphorus and some sulfur with a little bit of starter K goes on in a two by two dry band. Um, we pull an air cart behind our corn planter. Um, so phosphorus is where it should be in a two by two band, uh, except for the small amount of build program we're using. So where many people with the move to strip till have taken fertilizer off the planter, you've stayed with starter fertilizer through the planter. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, we've, we've elected to keep the starter on the planter. It was, uh, well, we didn't really know what we were doing in the first couple of years. So starter fertilizer works. It's probably the best place for phosphorus and the most efficient usage of it. And we really like that about it. Um, we have played with a zero starter band transitioning that phosphorus to the fall and we've had some successes but a year like this one where we planted into ridiculously cold soils and having that starter band really really helped us particularly if the planter strayed from the strip 
Um, in the five, four or five crops we've grown with strip till, we've never really had that significant yield drop where the planter isn't lined up perfectly pulling in the rows. This year was the absolute exception of that. Uh, it, it was brutal if you didn't have the starter band. A uh, few other producers in the area, um, yeah, it, it, it was, it's stark. So for us, we already have invested in the equipment. It works very well. Our planners, uh, it, it works extremely well. Um, I, I don't see the need to take MAP off the planner. So it's MAP, it's all dry or the combination of dry and liquid? Yeah, so we, we do have a combination. We run a 624-6 in furrow. Not so much the placements or efficiency or the fact that we like it. It extends the range of our air card from about 60 acres to well over 100. And for us, the efficiency of that is, is what it needs to be. So how, with the move to strip till, how are you managing P and K within the entire rotation? Yeah, so we've not gone the once and done route with strip till. We, uh, I, I, our soils are pretty hungry when it comes particularly to potassium. So I, I really feel we'd have some crop safety issues if we were to do a three year in one application. So we're, we're choosing to kind of limit our potash to about 200 pounds per acre at any given time. Um, when we're in the other crops, we will broadcast fertilizer, uh, either soybeans or uh, in wheat. Cereals will get phosphorus in furrow and potash broadcast in crop or after or before, depending on the year and how that goes. Um, so we are, we're, and a lot of that is A, crop safety, but also to spread the workload out. So we've talked about some P and K program stuff. Just curious how your nitrogen programs evolved, you know, going from no-till corn into strip-till corn. Yeah, so basically we don't do any nitrogen with the strip-tiller. Um, and then we, we switch with our no-till system, actually all the nitrogen's up front. And so with strip-till we went to 30 inch rows, so we thought with side dress. But one thing we kind of have learned is roots grow different in strip-till versus conventional. So it's important, I think, with strip till, get your nitrogen up early, just so that it has time to get to your roots. Because in a strip till system, your roots go more straight down, where conventional, your roots grow more horizontal. So when you, if you get too late and it gets dry, you get burnt real hard having that nitrogen too late in strips. So one thing we learned just recently is we put the nitrogen as close to after planting as possible, and that we think that is the key, and we've seen it this year, so. When you do spring strips, how do you apply your nitrogen in that scenario? Uh, so we've, we've done some spring strips, uh, uh, again, when we can't get stuff done in the fall or uh, a little bit of corn on corn, uh, we've, we've done strip, spring strips. Uh, so nitrogen doesn't change a lot uh, other than uh, in the strip, uh, we'll basically still have, we'll back off our, our phosphorus and potassium rates a little bit because uh, the load of N plus K plus S can get pretty get pretty high if we're, if we're putting a full uh, half of our three years requirement of, of potash on. So, uh, but we still basically use the N from the, the map that's going on. Uh, quite often there will be a little bit of uh, ammonium sulfate in there, so there's the N from that. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll still put on our, probably our 30 pounds through the planter. Uh, in our system, we're essentially, we're blending it through that entire zone instead of like the, the really concentrated uh, job of a two by two. Uh, we're pretty confident putting on pretty close to uh, 100 pounds of N plus K uh, uh, and, and with a little bit of S in there and, and have not seen adverse results at all. Ken, what general challenges have you had in your move to strip till and what advice would you give to growers who are just looking to start getting into it? So when you strip till uh, you a lot of the sins that you used to omit with tillage you no longer do and so you have to start thinking ahead a couple of, of chess moves before before you adopt the system. Um, so tillage 
or sorry, residue management behind the combine becomes a lot more important, especially uh, in cereals, where say you're dropping, uh, you know, where you're windrowing straw, you got to be able to spread the chaff. Uh, in the fall as well, you don't want to uh, to mark up a field too awfully badly uh, uh, with ruts or or even just heavy traffic, because uh, you will see that in the strips. Maybe you didn't see it if you just ripped it or plowed it, but you will see it in, in the strip. Uh, in the strip system, so uh, you just, uh, I'm going to say the biggest two things are, are uh, compaction avoidance and uh, uh, uniform residue distribution is way, way more important in a strip system than it, than it would have been in a, in a tillage system. With the moves to strip till, what other general challenges has it created in the operation as a whole, if any? Well, I uh... Quite a few. Um, you know, we, we educated ourselves for six years and you can never plan for every scenario. And, you, you know, you, you, you're only as smart as you think you are. And um, <laughs> um, we found in year one and two the limitations of the equipment we had purchased and the uh, processes we had thought were best for strip till. Um, year one, we had far too small a tires on the air cart. Um, we weren't, we, we had, we knew the importance of guidance lines and keeping the uh, things labeled properly. And we did a very good job at that, but we didn't know what to do in year two. Do you keep it in the same spot? Do you move over? And we made some errors there early on that I really wish we could go back and, and fix. Um, I mentioned 2017, we made a lot of soil compaction in planting and spraying. And we've, in some of our fields, are still paying for that today. And a lot of it was because we don't have, we didn't have the technology we've since invested in to improve the flotation, VF tires, inflation systems, tracks, um, that I, I don't want to scare off someone who'd want to go into strip till, but you know your soils, if you're in a lighter textured soil, you probably won't have a lot of these issues that we do in our heavier clay soils. Um, yeah, but uh, the biggest one would be, th was we, we didn't, we respected the AB lines, but we didn't respect them enough. And I think that's a pretty common first couple years issue. So going back to when you guys first got into strip till, Gary, um, what would be your key messages to another farmer who's maybe thinking about it themselves and getting into it? You know, big challenges that you guys overcame getting into the system. Um, finding a unit that, uh, and we, this took a couple of years to figure out that would contain the soil when you're trying to create a berm. This unit we have behind us is probably one of the best at that. And uh, our first system, Soil was kind of more or less flying all over the place as you were trying to create a berm and wherever there was a chunk of soil in the middle of the, between the rows, ended up to be a hole in your, in your berm. Right. And that hole would never go away. So when you're coming in the spring, planting in the spring, you're planting in ununiform berms. So taking the time to get some experience with equipment on your farm or one that's going to do the job you're happy with, would that be a... Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, where the shank machine showed its, uh, its real benefits to us. And not every shank machine. Right. This one in particular. Maybe there's a couple other models, but I've seen other machines that aren't doing the trick either. Yeah. It's all about soil containment. Yeah. You know, whatever you bring up, it's got to stay in that berm.